I've known a number of psychotherapists who ask me, why doesn't the Buddha put fear in his list of the causes of unskillful behavior, along with passion, aversion, and delusion? And that's because some forms of fear are unskillful, but others are skillful. The most unskillful form of fear is the one that the Buddha lists in the four biases. When you treat people unfairly out of fear, there's someone has power over you, or you fear their power, and so you give in to them in ways that you shouldn't. There's also fear of death. What with the war and with the pandemic? That's a lot of people's minds. But the Buddha said that these kinds of things can harm you only up to the end of this life. The things you really have to be afraid of are your own unskillful actions, because they can harm you beyond that. No one else can send you to hell, but you can send yourself to hell if you're not careful. And this is the kind of fear that comes not with lack of power, but with power. We have power with our actions to determine our course, how much we will or will not suffer. And so the Buddha actually recommends a certain kind of fear. The Pali term is otapa, which we translate as compunction. The Thai is translated as fear of doing evil. You have this power with your actions to do good or to do evil. As we chant just now, whatever I do for good or for evil, to that will I fall heir. And it's so easy to misuse that power. especially when we don't realize that we have that power. A lot of people deny that. They say, my actions will have an impact only up to the end of this life, and then that's it. Zero. Nothing. And so in their calculations, they take only that far into consideration. But the Buddha is saying, no, that's just one working hypothesis. There's no proof that death is the end of everything. And it's a working hypothesis that teaches you to be very careless and to place the brute survival of your body as a very high priority, whereas the Buddha is more concerned with the survival of your goodness. This is one of the reasons why he has that image of the, the mother and the only child. just as a mother with her only child would protect the child with her life. In other words, she'd be willing to sacrifice her life to protect the child. In the same way the Buddha says you should protect your goodwill with your life. In other words, you have to maintain goodwill in all situations. You have to see fear in ill will, danger in ill will. Because it will lead you to do all kinds of things, even when you feel you're acting out of justice. You want to see somebody suffer, and the things you do and say and think will pull you down. That's something to be afraid of. Think of that image of the bandits sawing you to pieces. They've pinned you down. There's nothing you can do. The Buddha says, well, there is something you can do, and you can have good will for the bandits. If you had ill will for them, he said you wouldn't be following his teachings. And it's for your own good. You may think the bandits don't deserve good will, but deserving is not part of the equation. Remember, the Buddha compares good will with wealth. And it's wealth that you can create from within. And there's no need for there to be any limit on it. In other words, you can create as much as you want, and its value does not decrease with an increase in the amount of goodwill you've got that goes out. It's not like the money of, say, of a country, where the more they print, the lower the value of the money. 
you know, the more you produce, the more you've got. So you don't have to worry about whether the bandits deserve it or not. You have more than enough to give them. It's actually for your own good, because if you died with ill will for the bandits, that would take you to a really bad place. You might get fixated wanting to get revenge. And you can imagine a life devoted to the desire to get revenge. It's a miserable life. It just creates more and more karma. So here's a case where you develop goodwill out of compunction. That desire not to do harm. And especially not to harm yourself with your own actions. Here you've got this power to create happiness for yourself. But it can also create a lot of harm in the long term. So you want to strengthen the mind so that it can keep the long term always in mind. This is one of the reasons why we practice concentration, one of the reasons why it's so important that we have a sense of well-being that comes as we focus on the breath, as we focus inside. Because we're asked so much to go against our immediate knee-jerk reactions. And think about the long term. So to sustain yourself as you're waiting for the long term, you want to have this sense of nourishment that comes from within. And as the Buddha discovered after he had tried all those years of torture, self-torture, The path to denying all pleasure led nowhere. And he realized that he'd had that image of the, the wood lying next to water, the wood that was in water, and it was sappy, would not be good for starting a fire. That stood for someone who was both fantasizing about sensuality and also indulging in it. Then there was the wood outside of the water, but still sappy, okay, not indulging in sensuality, but still fantasizing about it, and the wood that was far away from the water and was dry. That would be the good wood for starting a fire, symbolizing someone who's not only physically distant from sensual, sexual, basically, pursuits, but also not interested in mind. And at first he misunderstood that, thinking that all pleasure was bad. All pleasure was like the sappy wood in water. And so he denied himself all kinds of pleasure. But he saw that that led nowhere. It led to death. So the question was, was there a pleasure that was not harmful, not unskillful, and a pleasure that was not blameworthy? And he realized that pleasure of concentration, what we call the pleasure of form. had none of those drawbacks. The only drawback you might have was that you get attached there and you don't want to go on to the higher levels of discernment and insight. But compared with sensuality, it's much less damaging. Nobody kills, steals, cheats over jhana. And even though they have jhana wars, they're just wars where ink is spilled, no blood is spilled. And you nurture that, that sense of well-being. Because as you look at your choices in life, you realize you've got to think of the long term, sometimes very, very long term. And so this gives you immediate nourishment so you can keep it up, so you can be in here for the long run. So we do this because we have a power. The power to create happiness, the power to create misery for ourselves, for others. And we want to make sure that we use that power well. After all, that's the message of the Buddha's life, the message of his awakening.
and we're going to live our lives with that message in mind. Conscious of the power that we have, and also conscious of what should and not, should not be feared. We're afraid of death, but the Buddha said that's not a thing to be feared. Actually, to be afraid of rebirth. Because the fact that you're going to be reborn opens you to all kinds of dangers from all sides. One of his heavenly messengers, or deva messengers, is a baby lying on its back, lying in its own excrement, helpless, totally helpless. You have to realize that this is what happens. You come back to the human realm, which is one of the better realms. You're going to be completely dependent on outside help. That's when your karma can come and get you. So you want to be afraid of doing the kinds of things that would put you in danger when you're in that position. As for fear of people who could kill you in this lifetime, the influence of their actions can go only as far as this lifetime. The influence of your actions can go much further. They have that much more power. So on the one hand, be afraid of misusing that power. And on the other hand, be confident that you can use that power well. If you're willing to train yourself, if you're willing to submit to the training, it can take you far.